This week on Off the Air, Greg Caserta. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Off the Air, the podcast. I'm Kayla Wenzel here with Thomas Quigley, and we are pleased to be joined by Greg Caserta. Greg has had such a prolific career, and it's really only just the beginning. He's worked as a national update anchor for CBS Sports. He's worked for the Buffalo Bisons, and he's a former Marty Glickman Award winner from Fordham. Greg, how are you today? I'm good. Now that I uh, I got the resume run down right there, I'm <laughs> I'm great. So I always joke like once I get that kind of introduction, and I've been on with uh, with a couple of the FUV people over the last couple of months here. Once I get the introduction, it kind of sets the bar pretty high. So then I got to just, I got to bounce after this. So I'm good. <laughs> you guys have a great day and we'll, we'll do this again soon. No, it's definitely all deserved. Totally worthy of the entire introduction. Um, so we're just going to get right into it. You know, t- starting with your whole career, beginning here at Fordham. How did you know that you wanted to work in sports broadcasting? Like, where did that passion come from? So, of course, I've got to start with my mom who I guess it was after my sophomore year of high school said, Hey, there's a sports broadcasting camp at Montclair state university. It was the Bruce Beck and Ian Eagle sports broadcasting camp, which is still around. It's just not called by that name anymore. I know that Dave Popkin does stuff with them, Tim Capstraw, they're good friends of mine. So uh, give them a little shout out as well. But after my sophomore year, I said, no, I'm, I'm mom. I'm not doing it. I'm not interested. She said, fine, but next year you have to do it. It was a five-day camp. It's basically like school hours from nine in the morning till three in the afternoon. And when I went there, I fell in love with it. I mean, that's really where it started. And what was funny is that I met two guys that would end up being WFUV alums. And I'm pretty sure that one was on this series, Justin Shackle, who I believe was on a few episodes ago. So I met Justin at this camp. He was a year older than me. I met uh, Brian Clark, a classmate of mine at that camp as well. So the three of us knew like, all right, we're at that point, we all knew we were going to Fordham. Um, So I I guess it it really started that first year. And that's when I realized, all right, this is what I'm going to look to do in college. I knew that I didn't want to go to a big school. I had visited Syracuse. The campus was too big for me. I also knew that I wanted to be a stone's throw from home where I could live away from Bergen County, New Jersey, about 35 minutes away. But if I needed to come home on a Sunday for dinner with mom and dad and get my laundry done, I could do that as well. So it was the best of both worlds. And then from visiting the school and hearing about the radio station from a few people, they basically said that it's going to allow you to do anything. And it made my decision pretty easy when all was said and done. As we're all aware, plenty of FUV success stories, yeah, ranging from legends like Vince Scully, Mike Breen. Uh, to the unsung heroes in production that have made it to the pro sports broadcasting industry. As someone who's reached that promised land of, you know, you did your first MLB broadcast this year, even if it was just in a fill-in role, you've clearly made your passion into, you know, a fruitful career. Can you talk a little bit about your journey from WFUV to calling a major league game? Well, it's, it's different, right? Because when you think about guys like Breen, Papa, Carino, K. to my knowledge, not a lot of them went the minor league baseball route, which is what I did. And it's not for everybody. As you guys know, there's no formula for this. There is no computation and there's really no, all right, at the end of your four years of college, you get your degree. In this business, there's guys like me who it takes time. It takes 10 years. Then there's other guys like Ruka, who, you know, you you get that opportunity early on. Spiro, you get that opportunity early on. Um, For me, it was grinding through the minor leagues. And you mentioned the Buffalo Bisons. That was the most recent stop that I had this year in 2021. So when all said and done, uh, at one point, I lived in six states in seven years to announce minor league baseball. Now, I wasn't there permanently. I was only there during the season. But it's every six months. You're packing up your stuff in Jersey. You're moving to a different state. Uh, You do your season and then you as soon as you settle into a new city, you're packing up your stuff and you're heading back home. So I don't know if I would recommend that route for everybody, because again, I think there's other ways to get where you need to go. Um, but for me, that that's what it was. And when all said and done right now, as I'm talking to you, I've called every level of minor league baseball, except for full season, a ball. So it runs the gamut of all the different minor league levels and uh, yeah, it's, it's been a long time, you know, it's weird because it's 
10 plus years in the business, which for me seems like a long time, but then I try and think about it realistically and I go, okay, I made my major league debut at 32 years old. That's pretty young for this business, um, which is, is frustrating because you see, you see the gamut, you, you know, you, you see how there's guys that again, get that opportunity at an early age. And then, you know, sometimes you get into your own head where you're thinking, all right, well, I haven't gotten that break yet. Does that make me a failure? And, you know, you realize that, no, not necessarily. It's just, it's the right place. It's the right time. Um, I equate it to a guy that's in AAA, absolutely hitting the cover off the baseball. And the fans are clamoring for him to get called up. But for whatever reason, it just hasn't happened yet. Um, so, it, you know, 10 years in the business since I graduated, but now we're talking about my early days at FUV. And guys, that's now 15 years ago. So when I look at the numbers that way, now it does seem like a long time. And now I do feel older than, uh, than maybe I feel today. <laughs> that is crazy. But you've had such like a long career and you've been in minor league baseball for so long. What do you like most about it? Like what keeps kind of drawing you back into being willing to go to seven different states and to go everywhere? Like what makes you like what's the passion for minor league baseball, I guess? I love the day to day. And I think for me, I knew right away and I was given the warning ahead of time. Like people told me, listen, you're going to do your first summer of baseball. You will know about a weekend whether this is for you. And I knew right away this was for me. I loved the grind of it every day. I think early on when I was really getting those reps and, uh, you know, you'll ask any play by play broadcaster from their college days to their mid 20s. When you get that line of, hey, you got to get those reps, you're like, oh, enough about the reps. I'm sick of reps. I don't <laughs> want to hear it. It wouldn't matter who's telling you that, too. It could be Breen. It could be Dave Sims. It could be Sam Rosen or Doc Emmerich. Um, but when you hear that, you're like, all right, enough about the reps. Guess what? They're right. You need those reps. Um, so for me early on, I think when I was making more mistakes and I was taking more risks and I was really developing who I was as a broadcaster and finding my style, I love that if on a Thursday night, I was not good by my own standards, which are pretty lofty, I knew that Friday night I could get right back to it. Um, I loved the preparation aspect of it. Now, it's not to say I don't love calling other sports because I do. But for instance, I've got a soccer game on Sunday and my prep work is being here. It's in my living room. You know, I could call coaches on the phone. I could drive out to practice on Long Island, but I'll sit in Long Island traffic. So that's not the best. But for me, <laughs> at the ballpark is the best because you get to go down on the field during BP. You get to talk to guys a little bit. That's the best prep work. For me, prepping for another sport where you're home and you're stuck inside, you get a little stir crazy. So being at the ballpark, um, you know, being part of a family uh, where not only your front office people become your second family, but the players and the coaches, you guys are riding the bus together. You're on the bus late. You're going to cities and checking into hotels. And um, there's a bond that you share. So it, it was one of those things that, again, I don't know if it's for everybody, but I knew pretty early on that it was something that I loved. So last year, obviously, minor league baseball, you know, given a couple of tough blows. The first, of course, the, uh, the shrinking of the entire uh, minor league system. Um, and then basically a few months later, if that, uh, you know, COVID becomes a serious issue in America and the entire season is shut down. Can you talk to us a little bit about how that felt, you know, that moment that you realized well, we're not going to have a minor league season and uh, what you basically did for that, that, uh, that off season and what it meant to be back in the full swing this summer. Well, Tom, I'm happy that you were winded back to one of the low points of my life. I really <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm just kidding, of course. Um, listen, as we know, from March of last year to right now, things have changed drastically. Now, they've gotten better, um, but my personal story was March of last year, before everything went to you-know-what, I was at Newark Airport, and I was two hours away from a flight down to spring training. I was going to call a phillies Orioles spring training game on MLB.com. It would have been my second straight year doing a Philly spring training game. And I was obviously jacked up for it. And two hours before my flight takes off, I check my phone and there it is on Twitter, Passin, uh, Rosenthal, all the baseball insiders, spring training, whacked. 
I'm like, oh boy. Now I had some family and friends that were going down to Florida. So I could have easily made a weekend of it. It could have been a guy's weekend. We would have had a lot of fun, gone to Burns Steakhouse a couple of times in Tampa and uh, been on the beach for a little bit. But I said, I don't know. I'm, I think I'm coming home. So I circled back around, came home. My fiance gets home from work and goes, uh, what happened? I go, well, spring training's canceled. And that's not good. That's that's really bad. Now, we all kind of knew it was headed that way. Um, but once that happened, I, I knew it was bad news. So, you know, at that point, you know, baseball covers half my year. It's basically March to September. So that's, you know, six out of the 12 months that I've got steady work. And this time I didn't. And I think we're all hopelessly optimistic. I think part of it was because we didn't know the severity of this whole thing, but everybody had dates in mind. Like, Hey, you know, maybe May 1st, maybe we'll get it going. And then it became June 1st. And then, Hey, you know, July 4th, May. And then it's like, all right, as you see that trend developing, you realize that it's not good. So a lost season meant uh, I had to do something completely different. I had to, in essence, survive. I didn't know what to do. Uh, but I did know that Amazon was hiring. So from March of last year to March of this year, uh, basically a full calendar year, I was unloading trucks in an Amazon warehouse about 15 minutes from Newark Airport, which uh, was a pretty humbling experience, as you might imagine. But listen, it paid my rent uh, for the time that I needed it to. And, uh, you know, do I have regrets about it? No, because of the circumstances that we were in. But would I ever go back? Also, no. Um, it, it was not rewarding. Um, I, I worked hard the way, you know, the way I would covering a game or prepping for a broadcast, but, um, you know, it, it felt like, it felt like 10 plus years of work got torpedoed in one fell swoop. And that was a tough pill to swallow. And then to come out of it on the other side this year and to get that major league opportunity, it, it gave me a reason to keep believing and, uh, and to keep me around in this. Yeah. So like during that off period, how are you still kind of like honing your craft? Because like there really wasn't like any sports going on. There wasn't that much to do. So like, were you trying to practice like on calling old games or like, how are you still like getting those reps in, you know? Well, prior to the shutdown of everything, my last broadcast was, so I do regular play-by-play for Long Island University in Brooklyn. They were a division one team in the NEC. So I've been with them for several years I'm their lead broadcaster. So I get their men's basketball, their football, their volleyball. My last men's basketball broadcast was March 4th, I want to say. And it was a buzzer beater to beat Fairleigh Dickinson in the NEC quarterfinals. And it's what I'm using right now is my basketball demo because I thought it was terrific. And then I went probably six or seven months without calling another game uh, because at that point, the baseball season's pooched. Uh, the fall season got canceled. Well, it didn't get canceled, but it got pushed back. So all the fall sports were backloaded to the spring. And so my next basketball broadcast wasn't until November. So it was probably closer to seven or eight months that I didn't call any games. Now you mentioned CBS sports radio. I was there about two years when COVID hit. Unfortunately, when that happened, they basically trimmed their part-time rosters. So Guys like me who were fill-in guys, and I was fortunate that I was there once or twice a week at the minimum, I just had my first shift there in 19 months this past week. So again, you're talking about the entire body of work, everything that I had built up, all the time that I had put in. And you know, I think for me, I thought like, all right, wh- what did I do wrong? Did I fail? Uh, you know, Have I failed? Do I have to do something else? And then, you know, people kind of talk you off the ledge. It's like, no, dude, it's a global pandemic. You know, you know, my father's a dentist. He's been in practice for 25, 30 years. He had to shut his practice down for three months. So um, you realize that it's bigger than you. Uh, but yeah, those, those months were tough where you feel a lack of creativity. I probably should have started a podcast like everybody else in the country. Uh, during that time. Um, I'm still thinking about doing that, but it hasn't happened yet. But no, I'd say for probably seven or eight months, I wasn't in front of a microphone at all. And uh, I think coming out of it now, I appreciate it more like we do with a lot of things. Now we appreciate things. We don't take them for granted. And I think what's made me better today than I've ever been is that I'm having more fun doing this because I really missed it. Well, transitioning into a more positive topic. Yay! Uh, (laughs) Yay! (laughs) This past minor league season, 
um, at least in the AAA circuit. Uh, there's a new playoff format added. That's the AAA final stretch. Um, and I wanted to get maybe some thoughts from you on it, on the new playoff format. Uh, maybe just go over it so that the viewers know what it is, um, maybe why it was introduced, and uh, whether you see it as a long-term change or maybe just, you know, uh, short-term COVID still around type change. So I think there's two things going on. You've got the the final stretch as they were billing it, which only was for AAA, the two AAA leagues. Uh, the other minor leagues still had their regular playoffs, although they had shrunk those. So let's say a 12-team league would normally have four playoff entrants. This year, it was the teams with the top two records. They would play a best of five or a best of three, depending on the league, and then winner take all. Uh, AAA did not have that. AAA basically tacked on 10 games to the end of the regular season, five home, five road. And then, uh, you know, they would deem who was the final stretch winner based on the best record during that 10 game stretch. Now, I don't know where I stand on it. I think having 10 extra games for us is good because you're getting five extra games on a homestand, which is a way for a ball club to make money. Um, I know from talking to players that I'm friends with that they didn't like it um, because, again, it's five home, five road, and you're basically banking on your season to end, and now you've got to prolong it for another week and a half. Um, you do have another road trip mixed in there. Um, but, you know, I think, guys, what what's happening now is, as you've seen baseball change a little bit here, and you mentioned some of the things in the landscape changing – I think one thing that they're trying to do, and I think it could happen moving forward, is limit travel. Uh, it's something that they used this year, and COVID was a perfectly reasonable reason to do this. I don't think moving forward, I would like that. You know, I, I hated having six game series this year. I did not like having 12 game homestands, uh, but I understand why they do it because it limits travel. So, I think it might, st I know the 12 game homestands or the six game series, rather, I know those are going to stay at least for next year, what they're doing with a playoff format moving forward. I think, um, I think it's probably going to stay the same, at least at the lower levels, triple A will probably go back to it as well. So now that your like minor league season is done, you had mentioned that you're going to be working for LIU a little bit. What else are you up to in this off season? So getting back into the fold at CBS, um, which is awesome. I, you know, doing updates there is terrific. And like I said, Saturday, this past Saturday night was my first time there in 19 months and they changed the update format. So I used to do updates nationally on CBS sports radio. And then at 12 and 42 past the hour, I would do them on WCBS 880, which as you guys know, was the Mets flagship station. Now that they've changed some things up, I got to do updates on WFAN on Saturday night. I was at the top of the hour. They're a minute, 15 seconds. So you're in and out. There's not a whole lot that you can chew on in that time. But listen, you know, for the first time, I'm on the biggest sports talk station in the entire country, the station that I grew up listening to and still listen to when I'm in the car. So that was pretty cool. Um, I don't think my frequency there is going to be what it was pre-pandemic, but getting back into the fold there is great. Uh, my LIU schedule is going to start picking up and then I'll do some freelance stuff here and there. LaSalle, um, Fordham when Joe DeBarry, uh, Joe DeBarry rather calls me because he's got plenty of guys that he can choose from, uh, with all the different sports and all the alums that are involved. So it, it keeps me busy and, uh, believe it or not, it's, it's going to sound weird, but for the last two days, I've got a family friend that owns a farm in uh, upstate New York in Goshen, New York. So I've actually been a farm hand the last two days. <laughs> And uh, I've really enjoyed it. It's different and uh, it gets me out of the house. It's a good workout. It's fresh air and uh, it helps out a family that needs the help. And it's a, a small business. So um, I'm trying to, to trying to do things to fill the gaps. And, and again, a podcast is is certainly in the cards. I, I think that's something that I've always wanted to do. I think that I'm a little hesitant um, because of the climate, uh, you know, you say one wrong thing and uh, context is taken out of it completely and uh, you get blackballed. So I, I've always kind of been very wary about doing it because I've never really wanted to have to worry about that problem. So for a podcast, what topic would you be considering? Um, you know, would it be in baseball um, or what, what do you think of that? It would be, I would say a mix between a like an Opie and Anthony Howard Stern type show with sports, but also my other interests. Like 
I don't love talking sports. As crazy as that sounds, I know that sounds weird. <laughs> I love call, I love calling games. Um, but I'll be very honest. Like when the game's over, it's in one ear and out the other. Um, I don't consume a tremendous amount compared to some other people um, that do the job that I do. I know that there are guys that it's like their whole life. And for me, it's really not. So I would love to do something that shows my personality and my sense of humor. Um, I, I'm a huge stand-up comedy junkie. I go to clubs a lot. I love music. <laughs> I love going to concerts. So like, I would love to be able to do something that's free form where you can kind of just do anything. Um, and that, I think it gives you that freedom to have some fun with it. So it, again, it's something that I think now more than ever, I've really been considering seriously more than ever lately. But again, it's, you got to have the follow through to actually to go along with it. So uh, we'll see that that's a, uh, that'll be the next announcement, hopefully. I love that you talk about the, that though, because I feel like a lot of sports broadcasters that we meet in this industry that we meet from FUV, they don't talk a lot about that balance between like their leisure and like other things that they like and their work, which is also sports. So I really enjoy that. Like you kind of were mentioning that that sports doesn't consume everything that you like. It doesn't consume everything that you do. And I think that for me, that's like very important because I feel very similarly about that. You know, and I'll use just a current thing that's topical right now. Like look at the success of the Manning cast on Monday Night Football, which it's not my favorite thing. I think it's good. I'm not gaga over it the way everybody else seems to be. But the reason why it's fun is because it's fresh. It's not the traditional formula. So I'm not saying, hey, we've got to just get rid of things that are traditional and that have made this business work. But, you know, I would love to hear... I would love to hear about these people, you know, not so much the, uh, you know, you got a chance to talk to Belichick. What did he say in the meeting? Like, you know, I want to know about people. Uh, one thing that's always drawn me to baseball and talking with guys is getting to know them, where they come from, their families, their backgrounds, not so much the, hey, what was that pitch that you hit out for a home run last night? Uh, I don't find that stuff all that interesting a lot of the times. I think there's a place for it. Um, but for me, I think what, what people would be interested in Greg Caserta about is who I am as a person, not so much the X's and O's and what goes on between the lines. Like, you know, I have things to offer in terms of my views on life and, um, you know, certain takes that I have on things. And I think I have something to offer there. And I think it's, it would be something different. Um, so again, like you said, it's, when the night rolls around, I'm in bed watching something on HBO or Netflix. I'm watching a, a new series or a documentary. It's not just, all right, sports, sports, sports. It's like, all right, we can pump the brakes on a little bit. Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be 24 seven. Definitely a healthy balance is uh, something to strive for, especially uh, I feel like a lot of people at, at WFUV right now could probably learn a thing or two from you <laughs> on that subject. But uh, I want to transition back to, uh, some interesting news uh, that kind of goes back to your days at Fordham. I'm sure you've heard about this by now, but uh, Brian Konacki, uh, Fordham baseball alum, reached out to Fordham about the rights to a video clip uh, for the purpose of creating a non-fungible token. That's an NFT. Um, and it's a, it's a really spectacular highlight on a play at the play, uh, and it's your voice on the broadcast. Uh, so can you describe what it was like calling that play? Um, and what you know about the evolving NFT situation then? So I know next to nothing about it, except for the <laughs> fact that, no, 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 listen, I know no, next to nothing, except for the fact that out of the blue yesterday, I get an email from Brian Kanaki, who I haven't talked to or seen in, I graduated in 2010, so 11 years. Um, you know, he, he got my email and he told me about this thing and he said, hey, can I have your permission? And yeah, of course, I, I don't do what you got to do. It's for his buddy's company and um, they're trying to market things for college athletes. And I love that. I think that's great. Um, but, you know, going back to that night, that was a couple of weeks before I graduated and it was a random Wednesday night game against Iona and uh, that play happened. And I forget who was editing the game. Somebody in the in the baseball press box goes, yeah, we're, we're sending that to ESPN. Like it was the early days of the ESPN assignment desk. I'm like, yeah, okay, ESPN, sure. <laughs> so at that point, I'm basically checked out of school. Like, listen, I'm I'm getting my diploma. 
I think I have like one or two more finals to get through. And then we've got senior week. So I'm just coasting at that point. So it was a Wednesday night. So after the game, I went out with a bunch of friends. We went to somebody's apartment and all of a sudden on ESPN news, there's Mike Yam, another FUV alum. And there's, I see that grainy video. I'm like, oh, that looks familiar. And they turn it up and they play the call. I was like, whoa, all right. And then it started making the rounds. MLB Network, I think, grabbed it. I know that uh, Reality mentioned it and said my name on Around the Horn so he could sneak in a WFUV plug. It was up for an Emmy that year for Play of the Year. Unfortunately, it lost out to a Brett Favre Vikings pass. He threw a Hail Mary into the corner of the end zone. Um, and I remember the ESPY voting that night. Like I was trying to get everybody like, yo, vote for this play. It's me, vote for the play. And we lost out to Favre. So, um, <laughs> you know, I think it was a really cool moment. But I think like a lot of things that happened at that time, I was really spoiled. As you guys know, being at that station, like you get to do things that no other college student really gets to experience. So I never wanted those moments to be too big in my head. I wanted to appreciate them and smile about them and be like, yeah, this is really cool. But I always wanted to think in my head, like, this is just the beginning. I didn't want it to think like, all right, I did it. This is the be all end all. This is the greatest thing ever. It's never going to top this. I wanted that to be the first of hopefully many moments. And, um, and that was certainly one of the early ones for sure. And uh, I don't, I don't listen back to it too often. My friends will occasionally tease me about it. Like they'll bring it up uh, because I listen to that voice and I go, well, man, the, you know, the voice is higher and the, you know, the, uh, the Italian Jersey accents a lot deeper <laughs> Uh, whatever that accent was. Um, so it's uh, it, it's something that when you bring it up, I'm smiling now because again, blast from the past, Brian Kanaki sent me an email yesterday. I think I should mention that just for the viewers, because I'm sure if they haven't seen the play, it's it's, it's Kanaki coming home on a, on, a, on, a, on a throw to the plate and he somersaults over the catcher who fails to tag him in the air uh, and he's safe, he's ruled safe. And my favorite part about the video other than, you know, the spectacular jump is the visiting coach coming out, running out to argue that he's somehow out, even though there's just no chance that he that he could have tagged him because, you know, his glove is on the ground the entire time. He's just as surprised as everyone that Konaki went airborne. Uh, so but uh, definitely go check it out if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, and Kayla, go, go ahead. <laughs> can, I, can, I just, can I just add one more thing? I, yeah. I think the coolest thing about it, easily the coolest thing about that, it's not even close um, and it's still giving me like chills when I think about it now is, um, Vin Scully must've reached out to Bob Aaron's to get my contact info. So one day I get an email from an address that I don't know, but it's a Dodgers email address and I open it up and, uh, I, I don't remember what it said verbatim, but the thing that caught me and it was very quick, it was just a quick message. Um, it said to the effect, hi, Greg, nice job. That play would have thrown me for a loop. Best of luck, Vin Scully. <laughs> and again, you know, where we are, you know, you guys understand that's, that's the dude, that's the goat. That's our guy, right? He's the guy that, that set the, set the tone for everybody else. So I told Bob this and Bob kind of grins and goes, yeah, you know, I, he, he reached out. I wanted to have him talk to you. Um, he goes, did you notice what he said in the email? And I go, no, he just sent me a nice thank you note. He goes, would have thrown him for a loop, alluding to the flip <laughs> over the plate. So Vin, in his mastery of less than a 50-word email, somehow painted a word picture. And aside <laughs> from it being just, oh, my God, one of the, one of the guys that we all look up to went out of his way to reach out to me. It was like, man, even when I try, I still can't beat that. Like, who would think <laughs> of that? That's unbelievable. I wouldn't have even made that connection. Not, like, not in a million I years. I would have never gotten see, that. I'm amazed Bob made the connection. <laughs> well, Bob, was, uh, Bob was on it like that. And then when he explained it to me, it was like the end of the usual suspects. And you're just like, boom, like, whoa, I just can't, I can't believe that happened. So uh, yeah, so Vin, again, just, uh, you know, cementing that goat status. That's incredible. That's, that's what we live for, right? That's like, if you be like in a nutshell is like having those like big moments like that. Um, so kind of sticking with FUV, 
what would be your advice to FUV like members right now? Like, how would you advise them about what they should make out of this experience, how they should be doing it and like where it can take them? So I, this could be a long answer, um, <laughs> but I, you know, I, here's the thing. There are certain things I'll say that is not going to be groundbreaking or different than anything else that uh, some of the underclassmen here, but the key is always say yes, do everything and also figure out where you want to be and what you want to do. Um, you know, if your focus is play by play, make that your passion and go for that. The networking thing is paramount to anything. And it's not just the Fordham connection. It's not the FUV mob. Those guys, yes, they will do anything for you. And that's a given. You know, we that's the network. That's the pipeline. You use those people. But you use anybody that you come across, any of the guest speakers, any of the people that you intern with during the summer. Those are the people that are going to help you. And then the other thing I'll say, and I say this as somebody that I think made the mistake, I had no interest in business. So I thought, all right, well, I'm going to major in communication and media studies because that's what I'm going for. Look into business, make yourself more well-rounded because I would feel bad for somebody that fell into the trap that I did over this past year of oh my God, I've put all my eggs in this basket and I don't have a true backup plan. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I thought about taking business classes to get my MBA. Um, that way I at least have outside interests and outside pursuits. You know, find something else that might interest you so that at least you're more well-rounded in that regard and don't make the mistake too late. Uh, you know, Fordham's got all these amazing resources to offer. And I think that to be like, well, I'm working at the radio station. I want to go into broadcast. Let me just take a communications major. You know, I don't really see the, the, the value in that. Like to me, like your experience, like what's going to make you who you are, whether it's on camera or behind the scenes is what you do at the station. So I would say, treat the classes a little bit differently. Don't, don't just meld them together. And uh, when you have those opportunities, like when you're doing those games and you're being a beat reporter, um, enjoy it because it goes by really quickly and realize that you're doing something that, you know, people a lot older than you wish they could do and they can't and you're getting that opportunity and uh, just to, to always give it your, your all um, because, you know, this business, it'll swallow you up pretty quickly. Um, not just your effort, not the effort that you have to put in necessarily, that's a given, but you got to be all about this. You got to realize like, hey, when people come in and tell you during these workshops, listen, this is really hard. It is really hard. But if you believe in yourself and you bank on yourself, um, you know, we, we could talk about the, the emotional aspect of it another time, but um, you got to be strong and you got to be resolute. Like you got to have the mentality of down, but never out. You're going to take a lot of punches. You're going to take a beating, but you're never going to stay down. Um, so that's my uh, my long-winded answer uh, in, in regards to that. Thanks so much, Ben. That's sage advice for, of course, all of us at the station. And uh, appreciate the, uh, the much experienced take on it. Um, but before we let you go, I want to ask you about the Mets. I know that when we had you on one-on-one -on -one earlier this summer, our friend Dylan Balsamo was asking you somehow – how are the Mets in first place? This is midseason, and we know how that all went. Uh, you know, in first place for the majority of the season. Now the playoffs are in full swing, and the Mets are not in them. So I want to get your take on just how this season went. And, um, you know, after we, we heard the news that they're moving on from manager Luis Rojas, uh, what's your assessment of the Mets' season, and what direction do you see the team heading in the coming years? You know, I think in terms of the direction, they are headed in the right direction because of who signs the paychecks. You've got the wealthiest owner in the game by a long shot, a guy that's already shown he's willing to make bold moves and sign Lindor. What worried me about this team this year and what I know a lot of Mets fans, if you go on Twitter, they'll say like, oh, this is the most disappointing season in God knows how long. I'm like, I don't know if it is. You know, I don't know if people after those 109 days in first place or whatever it was truly looked at this team at that point. It went, you know, this is a serious contender in the national league. Like, yeah, it was good. It was a great run, but I don't think people looked at them long-term and thought, yeah, this will be a team that contends with 
the Dodgers, the Giants, um, you know, and, and some of the other big hitters in the, in the National League. What worried me about them is the fact that so much of their success was tied to their ace. It's amazing to me how one pitcher, who's the best in the world by a long shot, who goes every five days, sets the temperature for that room. And the fact that when he went down with that injury, that armor that they had built up completely disappeared. And all of a sudden, nobody feared this team. And I found that to be probably more alarming than anything else. Um, you know, I think that they they did their best navigating through the thumbs down situation. I thought that could have blown up and gone way worse than it did. Uh, I think, listen, if you make the right move in bringing in a new president of baseball operations, you've already gone through Epstein. That was a quick conversation for whatever reason. I don't know why that didn't progress beyond just him and Cohen chatting. You know, everybody's talking about Billy Bean. And if you can get him and Bob Melvin over, not too shabby uh, because you've got a pretty decent core there. Um, you know, your, your lineup is going to look different, you know, Conforto being so disappointing this year was obviously a big hurt, uh, but Lindor turned it around in the second half. I think that's huge. I don't know what they're going to do with Baez and, you know, your, your rotation is, is still very much a question mark. So they have moves to make, but if you get the right person in there with that payroll and that flexibility, it'll be a really coveted job. And so if Billy Bean does take that opportunity, I think the Mets will be in good hands. Well, Greg, thank you so much for being on with us today. We had a great time chatting with you and we really appreciate you taking in the time to just share with us your experiences and your time from FUV. Um, so just thank you so much for being here. It is my pleasure. Um, there are very few things I enjoy as much as stuff like this. I know that uh, that Zoom is what we do nowadays, but for, <laughs> but for real, anytime I can do something for FUV, with FUV, it, it's, it's the best. And uh, you guys were great. It was so nice meeting you and talking with you. And uh, I hope we can do it again at some point down the road.